real privilege and pleasure to be with all of you and seeing that these are the inaugural Bannon lectures. I'm sorry for you that you get an American and not a Scot, and particularly an American who's now living and ministering in Italy. But a true pr privilege and joy to be with all of you and especially amongst those who are studying for the ministry. And so uh, my heart is full to be around young men and women studying theology and especially those who are thinking of going into the pastoral ministry. Is this okay? Okay, we're good. Uh, as Dr. Purvis pointed out, uh, basically we have three lectures today, three talks, and uh, all of which come from 2 Timothy. And I want to encourage all of you to really think of 2 Timothy as not just a, a personal letter from Paul to Timothy, but as a devotional masterpiece. Uh, one of the things that, that drove me to, uh, to write on, on this letter, this epistle, is the fact that 2 Timothy, for me personally, has been probably the greatest source of encouragement from God's Word as a pastor over the past 20 years. Uh, it's what I inevitably return to again and again to find encouragement. When I'm discouraged, and the ministry, if we're going to be perfectly honest, is full of discouragements, uh, it's what I go to to find encouragement. And the Lord has been so faithful to me and to I know so many others uh, to provide incredible encouragement from this very personal letter from the Apostle Paul to his young trusted colleague, Timothy. Uh, it's a unique letter in that it is the last piece of surviving correspondence from the Apostle Paul after some 30 years of apostolic ministry. So he's probably incarcerated the second time at this point when he writes in Rome, and he's looking at death, he's facing death, he knows that his, his time of departure is near. Uh, it's not like those prison letters that he wrote, you know, Philippians and Ephesians and others that, um, where he was incarcerated the first time and he had a little bit more liberty. This time he knows that he's, he's going to be with the Lord soon. Uh, he's in a difficult place. Uh, he's lonely. You know, please bring Mark with you, he says. He, he's, he's cold. Don't forget the, clo the cloak. It's, it's going to be winter soon. Uh, he's probably a little bored. He doesn't have the resources to redeem the time, bring the books, and especially the parchments. And so we get a window into the Apostle Paul's life that's very human and, and very honest. Uh, he's also talking about those who had abandoned him and the things that he found difficult. And yet his heart is full of encouragement and full of joy because he knows that the crown of righteousness is laid up for him, and not only for him also, but for all those who have loved the Lord Jesus and have received his righteousness. He's, after 30 years of running his race, he says, I'm ready to go now. But he's passing the torch on to Timothy because Timothy, who's an ordinary minister, not uh, an extraordinary minister in the sense that he's an apostle, he's not, uh, he must now carry the baton and continue to run, and he must now teach faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is the true apostolic succession. The Lord Jesus to the apostles, the apostles to the ministers, the ministers to those who can teach others. And this continues on to this day uh, as we receive the gospel. Uh, the letter, just briefly, as we think about uh, 2 Timothy, you know, again, it's not, uh, it doesn't have the, the grandeur and the majesty of something like his work to, his letter to the Romans, and that it has this wonderful, rich explanation of the gospel. It, it doesn't have the, uh, the kind of power or the punch that his letter to the Galatians have. Uh, but it's so rich and so helpful, and in one sense, uh, the first three chapters are really an introduction, full of practical advice, leading up to the main thing that he wants to say that's in chapter 4 that we'll think about in our, in our second lecture, uh, which is preach the word. Uh, but the first three chapters, and uh, again, uh, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to, uh, to read this letter frequently and, and maybe read it uh, today or over this weekend when you have opportunity, uh, maybe for your devotions, uh, to see the flow and the way in which uh, the first three chapters are full of 
uh, encouragement to guard the gospel, to uh, suffer for the gospel, uh, to pass on the gospel to others who can preach it, and to, above all, preach the gospel. And we want to dive into one section of those three chapters of introduction uh, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And so let's, let's, let's listen to God's Word. Now let's give our attention to God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, as we come now to meditate and reflect upon your word, give us understanding and insight by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that he would illumine our minds, O Lord, uh, that we would be encouraged to run the race that you have set before us, to keep the faith, to, to fight the good fight until the very end. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to see Christ always and to make Christ known. And help us, O oh Father, we pray, to be self-disciplined in the callings that you have called us to execute. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in recent years, the expectations for what a pastor should be have changed dramatically. Uh, for centuries, ministers of the Word were expected, first and foremost, to be scholars and expositors of the Bible. That was a given. Uh, as John Owen said in the 17th century, the first and principal duty of a pastor is to feed the flock by diligent preaching of the Word. That same century, the Synod of Dort in 1618-1619 adopted its church order for the Reformed Churches of the Netherlands, and it recognized the following as the biblically prescribed duties of a pastor. It's very simple. The office of the ministers is to continue in prayer and the ministry of the Word, to administer the sacraments, to watch over their colleagues, the elders and deacons, together with the whole congregation, and finally, to exercise church discipline with the elders and see to it that everything is done decently and orderly. Those five things. Very focused, very simple, very clear. Uh, the ministry of the Word was understood as preaching, teaching, catechizing the youth, pastoral visitation, and of course, performing weddings and, and funerals. Those were the duties which pastors were expected to fulfill faithfully, along with continuing in prayer and, and pursuing godliness. Very clear, very simple. Nowadays, however, it, it seems that that's not enough for a minister. It's not enough for him to be a faithful expositor of the Bible and under-shepherd of Christ's flock. Today's pastor is expected to be a dynamic speaker, expert counselor, marriage therapist, visionary leader, church growth expert, fundraiser, staff administrator, team player, and have a warm and winsome personality that makes everyone at all times feel welcome, loved, and important. Those are the expectations. <laughs> So, for example, consider the following qualifications. These are real qualifications published by evangelical churches in recent and real pastoral search advertisements. I'll just read four. Number one, he must, he must think strategically, must be culturally relevant, and must be an effective visionary. Two, he must be a, dis a decisive decision maker and able to cast a vision with long-term vision and building expansion. Three, we are looking for a man who believes, who believers are not able to resist because of the wisdom and spirit with which he speaks. 
And this is my favorite, number four. Our next senior pastor must be a senior pastor in a large church, has grown a church, a demonstrated leader, has a positive attitude, a team player, consensus builder. He is genuine and authentic, but doesn't wear his heart on his sleeve, culturally relevant, especially toward younger adult demographics, and has no outstanding unresolved issues. He is winsome, gracious, enthusiastic, discerning, confident but not arrogant, inspirational, creative, a communicator, a preacher, a teacher, a visionary, a delegator, develops a team, a trainer. He is technologically savvy. He promotes peace and unity without compromising doctrinal purity. That describes you, right? (laughs) If you are that man, you must be the Lord Jesus. There's nobody who fits that. At the same time, and it's probably why so many pastors suffer burnout. They suffer burnout because of the unreasonable expectations that are often laid upon them, and oftentimes that we put on ourselves as pastors. Uh, We try to live up to these expectations that your congregation, not all, but some, sometimes it's only one or two people that will put upon you. And then we put them upon ourselves. And this is why it's so important to go back uh, to the wisdom of centuries past and see what is the clarity that they had in terms of what should be expected of me as a minister of God's Word, because I certainly can't live up to be all of those things. And it's what makes 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 uh, to be so timely uh, for pastors, but also all Christians today, because if we don't go back to this, very often we'll find the pastoral ministry to just be an exhausting job full of disappointment and frustration. Uh, and it's why in, in the course of my ministry I've seen many of my colleagues give up. And we don't want to see that as a trend. And so here, uh, Paul uses three different metaphors to describe what ministers are to be like. Uh, rather than saying that a pastor should be a life coach, a therapist, a visionary, or all of those sort of things. He he says that a a man must be a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer, all centering on self-discipline. And each of these images describes a different shade of faithfulness to our Lord and to His people. And and this is important for us to consider as we think about uh, what we want to be as a pastor or what we should want to see in a pastor. This is good for both pastor and parishioner alike, and good for all of us, no matter where we are right now in, in our walk with the Lord and in, in, our, in our life of ministry. Uh, our desires should be the same as God's desires. And, and what God wants from the ministers of His Word is faithfulness, is faithfulness. You've probably heard that a million times. But it is the truth. That's what God wants. Not how many followers you have on a podcast. Not how many books you've written or degrees you have. Um, Not how big of a celebrity you are. He wants your faithfulness. That's what He wants. And that's really what lasts. So let's think about these three metaphors. But first, first, notice what He says in verse 1. We need to be strengthened by grace. This is the secret to faithfulness and the secret to longevity in the ministry. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Timothy, as you probably know, was a, uh, a, a, a timid person. He, he, he suffered from, from physical ailment, as we know. Uh, he has lots of challenges as the pastor of the church in Ephesus. There was false teaching. There were people that were attacking him, uh, people that thought of him as too young for the job. Uh, it seems that, you know, in the ancient world, uh, that by the age of, until the age of 40, you were still considered to be somewhat of a, a young man. And, you know, it's common for people to think that, well, what do you know? You're, you know, you're still a young man. Uh, and above that, he was, he was timid from uh, the, the challenges that faced him. And there's also, it seems to be, uh, a bit of embarrassment that perhaps Timothy and certainly others who were uh, under the Apostle Paul's tutelage uh, were suffering from. I mean, here is the, the, the great apostle, and where is he? Once again, he's in prison. <laughs> 
I mean, how can he be really the apostle, the spokesman for the gospel, and he's always locked up? And you look at his life, he doesn't look like someone who's blessed. He, he's always in some kind of difficulty or trouble, it seems. And of course, as we know, through those three missionary journeys and his last one, I mean, Paul just did not stop. He just keeps going and going and going. And yet, we can gather from uh, the, the Pauline corpus and, and the book of Acts a little, that there is somewhat of an embarrassment that maybe Timothy felt uh, being the beloved son of Paul and the young trusted colleague. And so he needs encouragement as Paul is about to pass the baton to him, as he knows that his time has come. Be strengthened, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So here he, he uses the present tense of the verb be strong to underscore the, the ongoing nature of its action. Timothy must continually draw strength from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean? Well, as we know, God's grace in Christ Jesus is not a stuff or a substance that, uh, you know, we, we take, but rather it's God's uh, unmerited favor, his, his demerited favor, his undeserved favor that's freely bestowed upon rebellious sinners who are in debt and rightfully deserve God's wrath. And this grace is only in Christ Jesus, the one who has merited that for us. This disposition of goodness and bounty and, and, and adoption by the living God so that we are his children. It can be received in no other way but through faith in Christ. That's why it's in Christ Jesus. Those who put their trust in Christ and what he has accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection receive a new status, a new identity. They are in Christ as people whom God has justified, adopted, is sanctifying, and one day will glorify. But how, do we, how are we to be strengthened by that? How, how do we draw strength from that new identity, that fact. What exactly did Paul mean here? Well, this imperative, it connects to what the apostle previously said in chapter 1, verse 7, where he says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Instead of offering Timothy cliches about courage or about self-sufficiency, Paul reminded his younger colleague that God supplies believers with a sufficient strength so that they can fulfill their callings. And Paul, here he uses the passive voice in the verb, be strong, i.e. be strengthened, uh, to emphasize that this grace is received. We receive it. This is why the gospel is so important. This is why hearing the gospel is so important. Why the sacraments are so important receiving, once again, good news that we need to be recalibrated, redirected in the way we should go. Again, not, not trying to reinvent ourselves as grand visionaries or life coaches or therapists, but as those who are proclaimers of God's gospel in Jesus Christ. And so to be strengthened by this grace it means to find our sufficiency in Christ by remembering our new identity and all that God has provided to us. So I wean he the gospel as those who are going to preach the gospel. It must first grip our heart before we give it to others. And whatever fears and challenges Timothy was facing in Ephesus, and there were many, well, God's grace would be sufficient to see him through. And today, as much as in the first century, the church needs ministers who will look for strength, not in themselves, but in Christ. Not in themselves, but in Christ. To keep going, to get through the next week, the next year, the next decade, and to finish well. The church does not need celebrity pastors who, who ooze with self-sufficiency and self-confidence in their abilities. It needs humble servants of local congregations who are mindful of their own weaknesses, but their confidence is in Christ and in the Word of God 
and their strength is in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. There's a sense in which we need weak pastors. Weak. And we don't like weak. We want strong. You don't want a weak body. You want a strong body. You don't want weak grades from Professor Purvis. You want strong grades, right? Everything. We, you want strong investments, not weak investments. But, you know, in the kingdom of God, so many things are reversed. And, and there's a sense in which weakness is not a liability, but, but, a, but a strength. <laughs> because, you know, usually we feel, we feel our weakest when our fears are greatest. Timothy had so many fears. Uh, but God tells us that our, our weakness and, and lack of ability, they're, they're not fatal to the tasks to which he called us. They're not even defects or hindrances. In reality, our weakness is essential to our callings, for it is in our weakness that God's power is made perfect. He makes his power available to us by the Holy Spirit, not so that we can look self-sufficient to the world, but to display his glory in, in weak and imperfect people, so that he gets the credit, so that he gets the glory. And so whatever your circumstances are right now, as students or in just in life in general, we, we need to remember that Jesus says to us, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul has a lot to say about that in this letter. We need to be strengthened also because our faith often wavers and feels weak. You know, sometimes faith feels strong and buoyant. It feels good, you know, when we sing Psalm 23 together. Uh, other times it feels weak and, and lifeless. But our feelings, thank God, do not define our faith. Rather, it's the object of our faith that does. And that object is Christ Jesus. As John Owen said, a little faith gives a whole Christ. And so look to Christ and put your trust in him. His strength will sustain you through every storm and every trial of life and will help you with these three metaphors. The first is soldier. Verse 3, we need to be strengthened for loyalty, to be loyal to Christ. We find the first of the three metaphors which Paul employs to describe a faithful minister. You must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus. Roman soldiers were obviously a common sight in, in the, the first century world in which Paul and, and Timothy lived. And uh, their, their loyalty to uh, the, the, the Senate and the people of Rome, uh, you know, SPQR, if you've seen the movie Gladiator where he's scratching off the tattoo on his arm, they would do that to the soldiers. They would tattoo that on them. And if you've ever been to Rome, it still has those four letters everywhere, the Senate and people of Rome, even on the manhole covers and everywhere you go. Uh, it, your loyalty as a soldier was to the Senate and the people of Rome. And even today, we know in, in the military, uh, at least in the United States, you, you have to raise your right hand and take an oath to the Constitution and, and the people of the United States. Uh, loyalty is fundamental. Uh, it's why the, the saying in the, the motto of the United States Marine Corps is semper fidelis, always faithful. Loyalty. We need to be strengthened for loyalty in the same way as ministers. We're called to be loyal to Christ and to his gospel. So we need to be strengthened by his grace, really, so that we can be loyal to him. And, and Paul emphasized loyalty as, a, as an essential characteristic of the faithful minister because he knew that Timothy's loyalty would be tested as he took a stand against false teaching in the church. That's why he says you need to wage the good warfare in his first letter to Timothy. Wage the good warfare. It's going to require loyalty, though. And Paul knew that one of the greatest dangers that every pastor faces is the temptation to be more concerned about pleasing people than pleasing Christ. And, oh, that one is hard. That's a difficult one. It's, so, it's natural for us to want to be people pleasers and for people to like us. And I remember first going into the ministry and, and just having that overwhelming feeling, you know, as, 
new people would come to the church and we're trying to plant a church, I'm thinking, oh, please love me, please love me, please just like me. And we have to remember that at the end of the day, that's not what really matters. It's pleasing Christ, not pleasing people. And that will test your loyalty. It'll be a test. That's why he warns Timothy in, in chapter 4, in verses 3 through 4, as we'll see later, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And ministers can, we will be tempted at times to, to soften, to massage the text a little of Scripture, to soften the blow, to, to modify the apostolic message and really tamper with the good deposit that's been entrusted to us so that we can suit the preferences of our hearers. But that's not what we are to do. In a culture that says bigger is better, that the size of a congregation is the mark of success, that, well, pastors often feel great pressure to compromise their principles rather than suffer loss in numbers. And uh, his loyalty will be tested in many ways. If he, if he preaches expository sermons uh, through the Bible, Lectio Continua, uh, which you know, I encourage all of you to do, uh, rather than topical series, well, there's inevitably going to be occasions where you'll have to preach on a passage that you know will not sit well with everyone who hears it. And I remember hearing that when I was in seminary and thinking to myself, just my personality, oh, bring it on, I'll be ready, I'll just let them have it. And, uh, and then it's the, the fear that can overwhelm you is another thing. When you really have to preach on something and you get to know people and where they're at and what their concerns are and, oh, this guy, he's of this persuasion and that person's of this persuasion and, oh, how am I going to do this? Your loyalty is to Christ. Your loyalty is to Christ. And that will be your guide. Always speaking the truth in love, in love and patience as a shepherd. But your loyalty is to Christ, loved ones. It's always to Him. There will be instances when we'll need to convince, rebuke, and exhort those who are in rebellion, risking damage to our rep reputation as a, a likable person. There'll be times when we have to stand up for what is right with regard to biblical doctrine or reverent worship, knowing that what is right and what is popular will not always be in sync. But a minister is not called to be popular. He's called to be faithful. He's called to be loyal to Christ. And the motivation for such single-minded single loyalty is always to please Him, the Master to please the Lord. And so Paul says in verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. The implication was that Timothy was not to allow anything in his life to distract him from losing focus and, and remaining loyal to, to Christ, even if it meant foregoing some personal freedoms from time to time. So be strengthened in the, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus so that you may be loyal to Christ as a good soldier. Then, be strengthened for integrity, like an athlete. We need to have integrity. So in verse 5, Paul switches from the metaphor of soldier to that of an athlete. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Every sport has rules, we know it. That's, that's what makes uh, sports so great, is that we're supposed to compete according to the rules. And so every sport has its champion, right? Whether it's the, the team that wins uh, the, the Champions League, uh, which we hope is AC Milan this year, uh, or it's you know the, the PGA golfer who wins the Masters Tournament or something else. And when we hear stories of athletes who cheat, uh, who use PEDs or, or other substances or change the rules, uh, it's, it's dishonorable. It makes you feel sick. And, and so Paul's drawing upon that. They had sports in the ancient world. He often has uh, sports illustrations that he uses in, in his corpus. Uh, 
compete according to the rules if you were going to wear the wreath from the, uh, the Olympian Games or the Isthmus Games. Uh, you had to have competed according to the rules. That's what makes sports so great, is let's see who can be the champion playing according to the rules. So the moral standards need to be high. The moral standards of competition in the first century were very high. And Paul applies that to the ministry. We need to have a high moral standard. Like Paul, we must fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith. We need to press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And we must always strive to exemplify the qualities of an overseer that Paul laid out in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, to be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but covet, not covetous. Uh, so far more than a, a pastor's popularity, uh, or his effectiveness as uh, uh, a personality uh, really is his loyalty and his integrity. Uh, it's more important that he stays faithful in these ways than that he is perceived as a successful church planter, church grower, conference speaker, published author. And, uh, he needs integrity integrity to labor like a self-disciplined athlete in the fear of the Lord. That's important. And I'll just add that, that, that uh, it's worth adding today in our, in our age of uh, Google and, and the internet. It means that ministers need to do their own work. Don't plagiarize, brothers. Uh, one of the most discouraging things I ever saw was a colleague be deposed on the floor of classes for plagiarizing sermons. And it's so easy today to do that. But if we're going to labor with integrity before the fear of the Lord, we need to do our own work. Uh, let God speak through you, your personality, and who you are. You have something to offer in the way that God has made you. And it's His gospel and His word that's going through you. Uh, we don't want to, want to steal another person's word. Christians today complain of hearing the identical sermon sometimes, even text outline points the whole bit from more than one preacher without any acknowledgement that the work was not original. We need to labor with integrity, and God strengthens us so that we can do that. Just be strengthened by His grace so you can be faithful, so that you can be loyal, so that you can have integrity. And the third thing is be strengthened for constancy. Now he uses the, the imagery of a farmer. In verse 6, he, he uses the third metaphor to describe a minister's faithfulness. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. So a soldier needs to serve with loyalty. The, the athlete must play with integrity. And the farmer needs to work with constancy. Constancy every day rising up early and, and tending to the ground. Good farming depends as much on a, a farmer's relentless work ethic as it does as good soil and weather. Uh, this was especially true in the ancient world before the rise of mechanized equipment. So, so Paul, here he, he says that the hardworking farmer is a model for, for ministers to emulate as much as uh, athlete and, and soldier are. Uh, an outstanding work ethic is really necessary for the ministry. Uh, you're going to be alone in the, the privacy of your study, and to stay focused with constancy is something that we need to cultivate, something that we really need to uh, constantly work on, is being self-disciplined in this way, like a farmer, laboring, an outstanding work ethic. A pastor must stay focused on the tasks to which he has been called, continuing in prayer, laboring in the Word, administering the sacraments, catechizing the youth, assisting the elders, and shepherding and disciplining the congregation. Again, those five things. Just those five things. He must also preach the gospel like a farmer sowing seeds for a future crop. 
for he's been sent out as a laborer into the Lord's harvest. God uses the, the means of his word to bring a whole harvest of souls. And so we need to go out and bring the seeds. As, as Paul told the Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Ministers of the gospel then can be confident that the Lord will use their labors and graciously reward them, which seems to be an allusion to the, the apostles' words in verse 6, that the farmer must be first to partake of the crops. So let's be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus so that we can labor with faithfulness like these three metaphors and with loyalty, integrity, and constancy. And then notice that he says, think over what I say. The last thing in conclusion, the, the, the analogies of soldier, athlete, farmer, they, they warrant our reflection. Think over what I say. Meditate on these things. Soldier, athlete, farmer, not therapist, expert marriage counselor, visionary, uh, uh, fundraiser, uh, rather Soldier, athlete, farmer. Reflect on these things. Consider what I say, he says in verse 7. And may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Timothy was to carefully consider uh, these three models of service and suffering for the gospel. And so must the church today. So must we. Pastors need to remember their calling as ministers of the word. They're not called to reach for the stars. They're not called to be celebrities or meet every unrealistic expectation. They're called by God to be faithful in the duties of feeding Christ's flock and tending his sheep. And as ministers of the gospel, we need to return frequently to those three models of service in verses 3 through 6 and meditate upon them. Meditate upon them. And we would also do well to, to remember our vows and the, the charge given to us on the day of our ordination. Of course, no man is sufficient for these things, right? Again, weakness is fundamental. Uh, it's precisely why we need to be strong, not in ourselves. You know, Paul doesn't tell Timothy, be strong, Timothy. He says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace is for the weak. Grace is not for the strong. Grace is for the needy. As Jesus said, if they're, if, if they're right, I didn't come to feed, to call the righteous. I came for the sick. And that's who we are. We need grace. Be strong in that grace. Be strong in that grace. Men who enter the ministry inadequately, uh, they're, they're inadequately aware of how dependent they are on the grace of God. And I think at the beginning, you often think, oh, I just need to get through it. And even now, ministering in Italy, at the beginning, it was you know, getting through a sermon without mispronouncing too many words uh, in a second language. But we're, we're, we're often unaware of how dependent we are on the grace of God for everything from beginning to end in the ministry. We'll never outgrow our dependency upon God's grace, even 10 or 20 or 30 years into the ministry. And so it's incumbent upon us as ministers, as much as for all Christians, but speaking to those particularly who are thinking of going into the, the pastoral ministry, it's incumbent upon pastors that they anchor their hope in Christ Jesus and not in their results. And the only way we can be faithful to the Lord is by being strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And that also means, you know, as you have a pastor now, uh, where, you know, as you're a student or whatever your church situation or, or ministry situation is, whatever pastor you are, whoever he is, he's imperfect. That's obvious. Don't put unrealist, unrealistic expectations upon him. Uh, pray for your pastor. Uh, do not pray that he will meet your expectations, but that he will be faithful in his duties to preach the gospel and bring Christ to you in word and sacrament week after week after week.
Pray that he will be faithful like a soldier, athlete, farmer. If your pastor is faithful in those things, thank God for him. Uh, Don't be critical of him because of the gifts that he does not possess. Rather, be thankful for those which he does. And above all, pray that he will continue to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Remember, too, that your pastor is not the one to whom the church is married. Christ is. The pastor's job is simply to bring us to Christ and remind us of our identity in him because ultimately it's Jesus who is the one we need. Ultimately, he is the one who is loyal like a good soldier, fulfilling perfectly the Father's will. He's the one who lived with flawless integrity like a self-disciplined athlete, meriting the righteousness that we need so that we can stand blamelessly before God. Jesus is the one, ultimately, who worked with constancy like a devoted farmer, accomplishing all the work that the Father gave him to do. He, and not our pastor, is the shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Uh, Put your trust in him and thank him for those ordinary, fallen and flawed men whom Jesus has called to feed his sheep and labor like soldiers, athletes, and farmers. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. And we thank you for your church. Lord, we know that your church is imperfect. And yet, Lord, you love her. You are delighted in her. Oh, Lord, may we bask in your grace and in your mercy and in your love for the church. Lord, we pray that uh, you would help those preparing for the ministry and those who are in the ministry to truly labor with self-discipline as soldiers, athletes, and farmers, but always finding their strength, not in themselves, but in in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, your Son. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.